everybody and welcome! It's been a while since there were some significant updates in the world of Super Heavy Rocketry, but there have been some stirrings in Russia. Yes, after years of nothing but Soyuz launches, the signs are increasing that Russia is finally beginning work on their next generation launcher platform. Or are they? Well, the main news is that the director of Russian space agency Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, was at the Kremlin in February discussing the state of the Russian space program with President Vladimir Putin. Some reports emerged afterwards that funding was agreed on for the development of a new Russian launcher platform. But these reports have later been denied and Roscosmos has refused to comment. The problem is, reports about the proposed rocket called Yenisei, named after a river, have been circulating for years now. Basically, the idea is to throw together a mix of tried and tested components and create a super heavy rocket capable of lifting a hundred tons into Earth orbit or transport a lander to the moon. Sounds familiar? Yes, this sounds a lot like what's going on with NASA's SLS system. So I thought let's make a list of similarities and here it is. 7 things the SLS and the new Russian super rocket have in common. Politics. Before we dive into the technical details, we have to realize something. Both the Yenisei as well as the SLS or Space Launch System are subject to politics. Roscosmos and NASA are both government agencies and therefore have to rely on good standing with politicians and get funded through the budget of their respective nation. This also means that the development of both launch systems is subject to political influence. I am not that familiar with the Russian situation, but many critics of the SLS say that it is just a gigantic job generation program instead of an efficient rocket production enterprise. Which then results in… Huge costs. 22.3 billion dollars. Or 1.5 trillion rubles. That's the reported cost of developing the Yenisei. But the price tag contains not only the rocket itself, but also the infrastructure necessary to build, transport and launch it. One way to save money for the Russians was to limit the booster diameter to 4.1 meters. That way they could still use the existing railroads that have already transported the Proton rocket with the same diameter. Speaking of transport, the proposed launch site is Vostochny Cosmodrome to the far east of Russia. Roscosmos is spending millions to upgrade the facility, mainly to decrease reliance on Baikonur, a launch site that has been on Kazakh territory after the fall of the Soviet Union. Now let's talk SLS. You think 22.3 billion dollars is expensive? The SLS project has already cost almost 14 billion dollars and is estimated to reach more than 40 billion with a few launches already included. On the other hand, you have SpaceX claiming that the development of their Starship slash super heavy booster combination will cost only 5 billion dollars to develop. That's multiple orders of magnitude less than both state-run programs, but, and this is a big but, the jury is still out whether or not SpaceX will be able to deliver at that price tag. I mean, it's Elon Musk we're talking about. Oh, and then there are the costs per launch. Conservative estimates put the price of a single SLS launch at 1.5 to 2.5 billion dollars. That is way above what a single shuttle launch cost back in the day. Roughly 450 million dollars per mission. Speaking of shuttle, this is a nice segue into my next item. Old technology. Yes, space nerds around the world already know that the SLS is basically a Lego rebuild of old shuttle tech. The large main tank, taken straight from the shuttle. The four RS-25 main engines. Yes, space shuttle. The large solid rocket boosters, space shuttle, but with an added fifth segment. The upper stage of the first mission to space will be a modified second stage from the Delta IV rocket. That's actually a pretty Kerbal way of doing things. 
The only really new thing so far is the Orion spacecraft that was successfully flown in 2014, albeit uncrewed. Now, compare that to the Russian Yenisei. Its central booster is powered by the famously efficient RD-180 engine. In addition to that, up to six boosters can be strapped to the side, which would separate in a weird staging formation. First, four boosters would separate in pairs of two, then the two remaining boosters would separate. Oh, and those boosters? They would also use an already familiar engine, the RD-171, which is derived from the RD-170 used for the legendary Energia rocket and which is used in the Zenith rocket. So basically you could say Roscosmos wants to tie as many Zenith boosters as possible together and hope for the best. The proposed upper stages of the vehicle would also use engines that have already been used before. Compare these concepts, SLS and Yenisei, to what SpaceX and Blue Origin are doing. Both Starship, as well as New Glenn, propose to push the envelope of what's possible to enable new launch capabilities. Elon Musk claims SpaceX will be able to send 100 tons into orbit with Starship, while Blue Origin lists New Glenn as capable of sending up to 45 tons. All that while retaining reusability. Which leads me to this. Not reusable. Nope. Neither NASA nor Roscosmos are ahead of the curve when it comes to rocket reusability. On the contrary, both the SLS and Yenisei are designed as disposable launchers. Meaning, all the engineering, all the materials, all the hard work that will be put into each rocket will end up shattered on the ground or splashed into the ocean. It's a shame, really. SpaceX and Blue Origin both have proven the viability of reusability for orbital class first stage boosters. I know that the main focus of the state funded vehicles is to finally get some significant payload masses into orbit, but it would have been nice if reusability had been at least on the menu. I mean, the US already had the Space Shuttle, and Russia had the Buran, which was even more capable but only made one successful test flight. They also had the bonkers concept of the Energia 2, sometimes called Uragan, which consisted again of a big main booster with four smaller boosters strapped on. The idea was for each of these to use attached wings to fly back to an airfield. The idea never left the concept stage though. There's also the question how safe that would have been for a crew. Speaking of crew, that's one aspect of the new vehicles. Launch new crew capsules. Yes, both the Russian Super Heavy Launcher Project as well as the SLS include plans to launch humans not only into orbit, but also to the moon. NASA's Orion spacecraft is already flight proven, but Russia's sequel to the Soyuz, the Federatsiya vehicle that is supposed to carry up to six cosmonauts to space is far from finished. The program has faced a couple of delays and there are even rumors of cancellation circulating around. Interesting side note, Soyuz translates to Union, while the new spacecraft translates to Federation, so they stick to a certain scheme here. National pride dictates that Russia will not want to let their launch capabilities go to waste or just keep continuing to use the really old Soyuz design. Especially now that the US have increased their options with SpaceX's Crew Dragon and Boeing's Starliner. Currently, the first launch without crew of the Federatsiya is planned for 2022, with a crewed launch following a year later. But people is not the only thing these new systems should deliver to space. A hundred tons to orbit. It's a bit of a magic number, isn't it? 100 tons to Earth orbit. Both the SLS and the Yenisei claim to be able to do so. To be honest, the SLS is a bit below that, clocking in at 95 tons for the initial Block 1 design, while the Yenisei is supposedly able to send 102 tons into orbit or 27 tons to lunar orbit. The latter will be the more likely scenario than one huge payload to Earth orbit. Although Russia has already tried once to send an 80-ton satellite to space with the Energia rocket. The Polyus payload, which contained a military laser to test space missile defense systems, made it out of the atmosphere, but a failure caused the thing to deorbit itself instead of getting into orbit. 
Both NASA and Roscosmos have larger variants for even bigger payloads planned for the future. The SLS Block 2 and the Dawn respectively both claiming to be able to launch 130 tons into low Earth orbit. Let me just say that I think that the Dawn is just a badass name for a massively powerful rocket and yes, I know that they actually mean the river. Nevertheless, both the Russian and American super super heavy boosters are even further down the line, which will be… well that's the question, right? Far from finished. 2028. That's the date proposed for finishing the Yenisei. The Dawn should follow two years later in 2030. So far, these are just numbers on paper. Let's take the SLS for comparison. The maiden flight of NASA's flagship rocket was originally estimated for November 2018. Unless they have done a super secret launch somewhere that nobody has discovered so far, that did not come to pass. Currently, we are looking at a 2020 date for the first SLS launch, Exploration Mission 1. But this was announced in 2017. Who knows how many more delays there will be? Keep in mind what I said in the beginning, the politics aspect of both launcher projects. This makes me pessimistic about the realistic chances of both timelines. Now add to that a lot of obstacles the Russian project has to overcome. Due to its length, the Yenisei booster will set a record for the largest single rocket element transported via railroad, if they manage to pull it off. The alternative is to use cargo planes. The famous Antonov-124 could carry booster segments of up to 36 meters in length, but for it to unload them safely, a um, lot more construction would have to be done at Vostochny Cosmodrome. This plays into the cost point I made above, which again will come around to affect the schedule. Ok, I really don't want to end this video on a downer. No matter the delay, I think both SLS and Yenisei will be quite the beasts to behold once they will be able to fly their first missions. And personally, I look forward to the day that this happens. Maybe I'll be lucky and can catch one of the launches live. I would really love to see a rocket launch live one day. So what do you think? Which concept shows more promise, the SLS or the Yenisei? Which has the most chances of success? And also, when? Let me know in the comments below. I'm looking forward to discussing this further with all of you. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel to receive future updates about all things space related in general and related to the space game Kerbal Space Program as well. Also, follow me over on Twitter. Let's have a chat. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.